Hey, it is good to be here. If we've not met, my name's Eric. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Let's go ahead and pray and get into God's word. Father, we thank you and we praise you. We give you glory today for you are the only one worthy of praise. Today we ask you, O oh Lord, as we dive into your word, would you give us eyes to see? Would you give us ears to hear? Would you give us the power to put your word into practice in our everyday lives? Lord, we thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you for your spirit that's here to transform lives. Would you do the work that only you could do today in Jesus' name? And everybody says, amen. amen. So hey, when I was in high school, they had these classes called history and current events. Did anybody like those? Anybody like history and current events? Like two, you guys are real nerds. I mean, something wrong <laughs> with you people. I did not like those classes back then, but I tell you, as I've gotten older, I really love studying history. I really love current events. And we're gonna share a bit of those with you today in the context of the gospel. What does it mean for us today? Why is it important to understand where we've been, where we're at, and where we're going in the days ahead. So we're continuing on in this series called Jesus Stories, where we're really studying somewhere around 37 different miracles of Jesus in the Gospels and how they apply to our lives today. But I want to start by sharing a little bit of what God's been speaking to my heart personally, but also what I believe he's saying to the church community as a whole. The Bible challenges us to discern the times that we live in. It says in 1 Chronicles 12, 32, of Issachar, men who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. God is looking for men and women in our generation who understand and discern the times that we're living in and who know what to do. What we're called to do as believers. How are we to live differently? What is the anointing that God has upon our lives in this dark generation that we live in? Yes, the days around us seem dark. Do you agree? Yes. Seems dark. But guess what? God doesn't want us to be gloomy and God does not want to leave us without hope. I believe the Holy Spirit wants to download to us today what we are called to do. And yes, I do believe he's raising up a people who are willing to go to any length to advance the kingdom of God in our generation. My question for you today, Journey, is are you that kind of group of people that is willing to go to any length to see the people who don't know him come to know him as their Lord and Savior? About five of you. Oh, no, I'm in the wrong place today. I said, well, Eric, I kind of haven't heard what you're going to share just yet. Maybe by the end of the message, right? So what are the times that we live in as Christians in our generation? I want to give you a brief church history, maybe of the last 50 years, as I've seen it through my eyes. The church has certainly changed a ton over the past 50 years. There have been a lot of different streams of Christianity that have risen up to shape who we are as a church today and what the church in America looks like in particular. You had great evangelists like Billy Graham preaching the good news of salvation to millions of people around the world. He said, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth and you shall be saved. What a great message, amen, right? Good on the surface. But also, at the same time, there could be this perception of cheap grace that's mixed in with it, right? If you come up to the front and you give your life to Jesus, then guess what? Everything's good, everything's fine, you're saved, but you can go on living like hell and it doesn't matter. That's not how it works. Hey, can I tell you something? It's a very good thing to come to the front. If there's an altar call and God is impressed on your heart that, man, I need to go to the front, God is stirring something in me, that's how it started in my life and the lives of many people who are in this room. Man, God did something, but let me tell you, that is the beginning, not the end, right? Amen. God calls us to have fruit in accordance with our salvation, that he calls us to have change in accordance with what we do. So in many of these movements, you're going to see some very good things, and you're going to see some challenging things that the devil attempts to distort in the midst of it, right? 
In the late 1960s, you had the Jesus movement that embodied the charismatic movement that started in the late 1900s. And man, there were some really good things that came as a result of that. Many of you may have watched that recent movie, Jesus Revolution, about Greg Laurie and the church. If you haven't seen that one, I encourage you to go watch it. Great movie about how God was moving in the United States during that particular season. It gave us the kind of worship experiences that we're having today, right? It brought worship and and the belief that God is alive and still moves in the spirit to millions upon millions of Americans. Lives were changed, right? God is good. There's good things that come out of many of these movements as well. In 1970s, you had guys like Robert Schuller rise to national acclaim with his show, The Hour of Power. Is anybody old enough to remember The Hour of Power broadcast from the famous Crystal Cathedral, right? He'd come on every Sunday morning. I wasn't even a believer and I'd watch that guy. I was like, he came with this message that was really not so much gospel, to a degree, if you really start to look at the history of it, it was a message of positive living. Okay, hey, positive living. You're going to be good. If you do what God says, everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to be dandy. And he really became the first mega church in America, right? That message that he spread, um, he did broadcast via TV, and he influenced a number of other churches and pastors that rose up coming out of the 70s into the 80s and early 90s. Uh, there was two particular churches that rose to acclaim in the United States. One was called Saddleback Church. Church. The other one was called uh, Willow Creek Church, right? So Willow Creek Church out of Chicago, Saddleback out of California area, and they became the seeker-sensitive movement that has really influenced tons of churches. So these guys like Robert Schuller, um, a pastor from Willow Creek, and the pastor from Saddleback really ushered in that mega church movement, which became a really watered-down version of Christianity. Even Willow Creek came out later, many years later, about 20 years later, and said they did a survey, and in spite of much of the decisions that they had where people came up and raised their hand and said that they had served Jesus as their Lord and Savior, the amount of real life transformation wasn't that much. It was a scary thought for them, and they did some things to attempt to change that, and sadly, their pastor ended up falling in sin as well. Um, Guess what? Pastors are not meant to be megachurch pastors. I hate to say that, right? There's only one who is meant to be famous, and I guarantee you it is not you or I, even if you were an influencer. It's a dangerous thing that most people don't handle well. Very, very few people have been able to handle fame all that well. Just look at the wreckage of so many people who get famous. In the 80s, you also had the falls of famous ministers like the Bakers. I'm being critical of a few people. I'm calling them out today. Come on, Jesus, but hey, Lord, I've got my own issues too. Call me out where I need it to. In the 90s, you had the Hill Songs movement come ag- around, right? All the, how many of you remember? Shout to the Lord, all the earth. Come on, you could sing it, right? <laughs> you had the worship wars of the 90s. You had the contemporary worship versus the, some of you are too young. You're like, man, I am glad I missed all of this, right? <laughs> But these were the things that people were debating. It was crazy to think about, hey, you're getting upset. I remember those eras, like people were getting upset that people were singing these new worship songs, right? And then if you go back and you look at the hymns to burst any bubbles who anybody who's old, most of the hymns were created from old bar tunes. Literally, if you go research the the beats and everything behind them, in their generation, people were saying, I can't believe you guys are worshiping God in that way, right? That's how stupid it was. Guess what, Christians? We are stupid sometimes. Come on, Jesus. Would you help us out, right? We fight over some of the dumbest stuff. In the 2010s, you had the gospel-centered movement led by people like Mark Driscoll. You also had, during the megachurch movement, other big people rise to fame like Joel Osteen and others um, as well. The 2020s, um, post-COVID especially, You have the rise of the internet influencer pastors, right? There's some really good ones out there. I would encourage Isaiah Saldivar, Vlad Savchuk, Pagani, many other ones that are really, really good out there that God is is using during this time. At the same time, you hear of these words like people are deconstructing their faith, right? Deconstructing their faith. There's strange times in which we live in. And all of these things, there's stuff that we can learn from and continue to do and other stuff that we should probably discard that is not part of what God really wants for our lives. 
I've lived long enough to see certain fads come and go, and I've been a part of some incredible, growing, wonderful churches over the years as well. Yet all along, at the same time, I still had this deep longing while reading the word that there has to be more to the Christian experience. Have you ever sensed that in your heart? Like I, I read this stuff, I've experienced it, I've been a part of these mega churches, and I'm like, something's still missing. Lord, there has to be more. When I read certain things into your word, it doesn't line up with what I see out there in the world. It doesn't line up with my Christian experience. Lord, would you help me to understand? When I read the word of God, these Jesus stories that we're preaching about, I, this, I see this depiction of a supernatural life where God changed everything for the people who heard it and experienced it. There were signs, there were wonders, there were deliverance, there was healing, there was real life transformation. Yet somewhere along the way, the devil seems to have convinced us that those things don't matter to Christianity anymore. I wonder, just wonder, if one of the schemes that he uses is to keep us dumb in that particular area. Why would he not attempt to strip us of the very weapons of our warfare that we need to combat the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places that are set against us in our own generation? They are set against us in our own generation, right? The woke movement, guess what, is demonic. The gender dysphoria movement that's going on in our generation right now is demonic. The racial stuff that sets one believer against another believer is demonic. The political stuff that you're witnessing is demonic. Eric, you're saying everything is demonic. Kind of. (laughs) There's demonic powers and principalities and heavenly places that are behind more stuff than you can imagine. If it was true in his day, why wouldn't it be true in our day? But yet the devil has told us, nah, you got to ignore that particular part. Could it be because he doesn't want to see people really set free? Just think about it for a second. I'll read some verses in a second here. But I mean, just think about his tactics for a moment here. Somehow along the way, American Christianity has been convinced to be Christianity light, a version that I don't read in the Bible. I don't know about you. And I'm afraid that I and many other preachers have at times regurgitated a gospel that is devoid of the power and might and the possibly could even be the doctrine of demons. Why do I say that? Wouldn't it be just like the doctrine of demons to tell you to ignore certain verses and go accept other verses that sound perfectly good? And then we preach them like we think they're just perfect, but then we leave the body of Christ impotent in its ability to defend itself? That's the doctrine of demons. That's what he's talking about. It's not just the crazy woke stuff that we read about in the news. It's how he subtly works within the church to convince us that certain things are not for today. Paul is the opposite of a mega church pastor. Listen to 1 Corinthians 2.1. And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and trembling. And my speech and my message were not a plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. But here's the scary part. If you think about how effective the megachurch movement has been, how effective celebrity pastors have been, how effective celebrity rock star worship teams have been, we've used them as idols and substituted them for Christ. There's this scripture in the Old Testament where God ultimately gets fed up with the people of Israel, right? They say, we want a king. We want to be just like every other nation. Give us a king. God's like warning them, kings do bad things. Kings are not good. Kings turn into idols. Why do you need a different king? I'm your king. Why do you need that? Maybe we don't call them kings today, but many of us worship our politicians in that way. 
we're believers in Jesus Christ, then we let people divide us over Biden or over Trump, and they're both crazy? Come on, Jesus. Like, I mean, like, <laughs> think about it for a minute. But not even that. Our mega church pastors often, not all, I'm not, I can't say all universally, they get up there and they preach these candy stick messages that sound good to the ears and they fill them up to the tunes of thousands upon thousands of people and everybody longs to go see Joel Osteen and everybody longs to go see Stephen Furtick and everybody longs to go see whoever their favorite rock star pastor is. They're just human beings like you and I and most of them are gonna fail. Stop looking for an earthly king. Look to the king of the universe. Look for preachers like Paul that just want to come and preach and share the good news. Guess what? I'm going to go for those of you who are worship team groupies also. Come on, Jesus. I'm going to call you out for a second. Don't go everywhere spending all your money. If you're spending more money on going to Christian concerts than you're tithing, come on, Jesus. You got an issue. If you're following around all of those rock stars, looking at them like they're something special, no, no, no. They're not Jesus. They're not Jesus. I had a a rule around here. We would pay the worship leader. We would pay nobody else. There's entire movements where they're going to pay every single person on stage so that they could get a professional sound and a professional perfection that's up there so that they could bring the masses in and they do their perfect rock star performance every single weekend. Man, I'll tell you, I'd rather listen to Wendy and the rest of them every single week than any of those paid ones that are out there. God has an anointing on them in their worship. And they're doing it not because they're getting paid. They're doing it because they love Jesus. That's what it's about. We get deceived into following after these earthly idols that aren't making any sense, Christians. Lord, would you help us? May we not be a people of lofty speech or wisdom, but Lord... Would you accompany the preaching from this pulpit with words of power and anointing that change lives? Pastor Adam's been talking about authority for the past two weeks. He opened up with the following verse, Mark 1, 25. But Jesus rebuked him, speaking to a demon, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and cried out with a loud voice came out of him. And they were all amazed so that they questioned themselves and saying, what is this? A new teaching with what? Authority, right? He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. Was this a new teaching? History lesson. It was. They understood what demons were. Did you get that? It says, they saw, who is this that even the demons agree? But guess what? They had never seen a demon cast out before that. Because Jesus came onto the scene with anointing and with authority to cast out those unclean spirits, right? He came to cast them out and set something new and transform lives. So they had never experienced, like, what is this? How crazy is this that even the demons obey? Nobody before that moment in a practical sense had been delivered from a demon until that time. But Jesus, the son of the living God, comes on the scene and changes everything. I read verses like Mark 1 in our generation, and I think, why not here? Why not now? Why has the church accepted a watered-down Christianity? When there are so many sections of Scripture that tell us we should experience the supernatural as part of our normal Christian experience. Yet preachers for years and years have told us that's not true. You shouldn't do that doctrine of demons in Jesus' name. I'll go ahead and be bold enough to say it. Think I'm wrong? Sending of the 12, Matthew 10, 7. He sends out the first disciples. He says, and proclaim to them as you go saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then what did he tell them to do? Anybody want to read it? Read it. But Eric, that was for that time. That was only for that time. He sends out the 72. I'm not going to have that verse up there, but he basically tells them the exact same thing. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse leopards, cast out demons. We have the great commission and the great commandment. 
Matthew twenty two thirty six. teacher, who is the greatest commandment of the law? And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. We all know that one and love it, don't we? Guess what? You're all going to know and love this next one too, Matthew twenty eight eighteen. And Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I've been a part of churches that grew from 300 to 5,000 in a few years. I've been a part of churches that grew from 1,000 to 5,000, 15,000 in a few years. Every one of them preached this verse over and over again. They would challenge people, even as I will do to you today, and say, guess what? Evangelism should be part of what we do. Go out there and change the world, man. This is part of what we need to do. You need to go out there and raise disciples. But not out of one of them did I hear narrow a word about the next verse. Why do we always stop there? Like, Eric, what are you talking about? I don't know what the next verse. That is the Great Commission, is it not? Maybe the devil's dumbed us down for just a little bit here. Because Mark reads slightly different. He says, and he said to them, go to all the world and proclaim the gospel to whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And whoever does not believe will be condemned. So, okay, let's stop there for just a second before we read 17. If the great commandment and great commission are for today, why would verse 17 not be for today? Because it goes on to say, and these signs shall accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them. So they lay their hands on the sick and they will not recover. When things don't make sense, guess what? A lot of the times it's the devil, man. I mean, they go and they take this one verse and everybody's parroting it and everybody's saying it and everybody's fired up about it and stuff just don't make sense. I heard an argument about abortion the other day and it was kind of strange, right? This guy talks and he asks the other guy, hey, so abortion is a woman's right. She could do whatever she wants with her body, right? You know, you could do it. Yes, we could have abortion up until the very last day before that baby comes out of the body. No problem. They can have an abortion. And then he turns the question, okay, okay, so it's a woman's right to do whatever she wants. She can do whatever we want. Yeah. Okay, what if that woman does meth? And it stumped him. He's like, he can't do that because it'll hurt the baby. So you mean aborting the baby ain't hurting, but you can do meth and everything's okay? doctrine of demons. People believe stuff that they don't even understand or know, but what makes you think, guess what? The devil knows the Bible better than you do. Wouldn't it be just like him to get you to stop at verse 16 when the next verse is standing in direct opposition to his kingdom? He'll let you go out there all day and evangelize, so to speak, But guess what? There's two parts, as you're going to see in just a second. There's somebody getting saved, but there's also somebody getting set free. You could be saved and not set free. We need to understand the difference. So if somebody gets saved, it's a loss for him. It's an L. But guess what? If they get saved, but they're still not set free, he's perfectly happy with that. He doesn't want you to be set free. Does this make sense to you today? So I make the case that Jesus, being the Son of God, spoke not only with words of wisdom, but of active demonstrations with authority and power, but also, why do I say it's for you today? What did he say in Matthew 28? All authority on earth has been given to me. And then he says, therefore, he's transferring the authority to you and I, go do these things in my name, right? So... You have the authority to do these things in the name of Jesus Christ, but rarely do we pick up that authority and go with it. I've often said that we are Acts 29 in our generation. For those of you who don't know Acts all that well, there is no section 29 in the book of Acts. It ends in 28, but you are the continuation of the story of God in our own generation. Acts 29 is being written by you and I. And as the end times approach, it says in scripture that signs and wonders will also increase to set the captives free and bring glory to God in our own generation. There's a guy, Jonathan Kahn, that's a messianic rabbi that wrote a recent book called The Return of the Gods. Powerful thesis. I mean, if you really look at the the underlying thesis of it, and his contention is just like the people in Israel 
They turned from God and demonic powers and principalities were released into their generation of which Jesus ended up kicking them out, right? Um, he goes with this one verse that we usually take at the context of an individual. And he says that when you clean the house of a demon and they go out, if you don't fill it back up with the Holy Spirit, then guess what? Seven more will come in and the state of the first will be worse than that original condition. But again, on one of those verses, we stop right there and we never read the next verse because the next verse says, and so shall it be with this generation. Do you get the difference there? So as a generation, if we begin to abhor God and invite the devils back in, the end state is seven times worse than the first. So I talked a little bit about church history, but can you think of what started happening like in the 60s with the free love movement, right? You can go out there, do all the drugs you want. So you invite in this one demon, first and foremost, like the demon of pharmacia to go in there and start doing drugs and alcohol and LSD and mushrooms. And then you say at the same time, you invite in the demon of pornographia, right? By saying you could have free sex and whatever. And then you invite in the demon of Molech, just like they did, where they sacrificed their thousands of children unto this demon. We sacrifice our millions unto them through free love. And now this women's movement where we can go out and kill the babies if we want to, no problem. We could do it for our own means you're inviting these demons back in and we wonder why all of a sudden when in my generation which wasn't too long ago gender dysphoria was like half of one percent and now it's like seven or ten percent guess what you've invited the demons to come back in and that's why you're dealing with all this stuff with this crazy wokeness that's a demonic doctrine that's a theology of demons so we're contending not against flesh and blood but against powers and principalities in heavenly places We should not hate people who are in any of these things. We need to start casting some demons out of these situations because you can give them all the facts you want and their mind's not gonna change. You cannot speak reason to a demon. There's some stuff in your life, believer in Jesus Christ, that counseling's not gonna fix. You've been to a counselor, you've been to this counselor, you've been to that counselor, you've done this, you've done that. Guess what? There could be a demonic spirit continuing to oppress you and try to keep you from your calling. If you're struggling with stuff that don't make sense, guess what? You're probably dealing with a demon. You need healing. You need deliverance. You need to be set free. Can I get an amen? Amen. Gee, Lord, help us. I am off base. I got to speed up here. Don't believe the lies of the devil. Let me finish with this. I need to tie it into the story. So the story that Adam shared took place in a city called Capernaum. In the preceding verses of the book of Mark, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. He goes out into the wilderness and is tempted by Satan. He overcomes Satan and he begins his earthly ministry by going to a city called Capernaum. What a fitting place to become the center of much of the Lord's ministry. The city of Capernaum means field of repentance and city of comfort. Mary Jo and I have had the blessing of being there. It's a city that's not very large. It had about 1,500 people in Jesus' day. And if I were to tell you that this is the temple or the synagogue that was there, the, the ocean part or the Sea of Galilee is no further than Blanding Boulevard, maybe even closer. I mean, it's even closer, the walk from here to there. So this is a small place. So when I read some of these stories historically before I began to understand the context, I would think, okay, like, man, this is a big place. How far away is these scenes happening from one another? But the scene where Adam was sharing about of authority about the synagogue is literally feet away from the story that's happening today. In between that story, there's also the calling of the disciples, the first disciples. Jesus goes to them and he's by the Sea of Galilee and he's saying, hey, come follow me. And I often think, okay, man, they just encounter Jesus and all of a sudden they're following him. This is a small city. It said that Jesus first came in there. He began to preach in the synagogue. Signs and wonders are beginning to accompany them. So he didn't just necessarily walk up to these guys and all of a sudden they never met him before and they're like, okay, I'm going and following you. Stories were already starting to happen about this Jesus. I mean, the water is literally like from here to the, you know, Collins, you know, from where they're at. 
The scene that I'm about to share with you today probably most likely occurred in Peter's house. Peter basically had Sea of Galilee beachfront property. I mean, we've been to where his house was said to be. You could literally look out there. So all these are happening one to another. I mean, like where Peter's saying, hey, I'm going out and calling Peter. It's like 10 feet from the dude's house. The synagogue that he's preaching in is like 100 feet down the road from where this is happening. This whole scene is happening right there where Jesus is doing and performing all of these crazy miracles, right? So when you leave Mark 1 and go to Mark 2, it says this, and when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home, probably home in Peter's house. Most likely he stayed in Peter's house. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them and they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not hear, get near of him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they made an opening, so they sat on the bed which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes sitting there questioned in their hearts, why does this man speak that? He is blaspheming. Who can get, forgive sins but God alone? And immediately, Jesus perceiving in his spirit, he thus questioned within himself and said, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk? But you, that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all. And they were amazed and all glorified God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Worship team, if you could come back up. So they're at Peter's house. He's preaching there, right? Room is full. It's packed. These guys have a sick brother that they want to get before him because they've heard all these stories of renown. So they go to any length to get up there on the roof and start to tear it down so that they could get this man to the feet of Jesus. I ask you, as I asked you at the beginning, Journey Church, what lengths are you willing to go to to get somebody to the feet of Jesus in our generation? If hell is real and people are dying and going there, Christianity cannot be contained within ourselves. If we really believe there's a heaven and a hell, we need to prioritize evangelism. We need to put the great commission and the great commandment into practice in our everyday lives. We need to prioritize that into their lives and look for divine opportunities to share the gospel and get people to these altars where they could be set free. They're in the city of Capernaum, the city of repentance, right? I tied it back to that story. Jesus first doesn't tell him, let me heal you. He says, son, your sins are forgiven, right? So the first step that God wants to do in anybody's life is see them get saved. Your sins are forgiven. But remember, I told you, you could have your sins forgiven, but you could still be trapped. You could still be in captivity. You could still not be set free. You could still be in need of healing. You could still be in need of deliverance. You could ignore the whole ownership of stuff. Well, if you go into the argument, the one that everybody hears is, okay, Christians can't have demons because, you know, the Holy Spirit possesses uh, our spirit. You know, that means that you can't have them. I am here to tell you that demonic spirits, maybe they cannot possess you, which means ownership. Okay, I completely get that, but they can certainly oppress you. They can certainly do everything they can to harass you and keep you from your calling. The people that Jesus was setting free they were believers in him for the most part, right? So not only does he say your sins are forgiven, he says, what's even harder than that? Okay, y'all think it's actually harder? Get up and walk. Be set free. You are healed. See, God wants to bring the city of Capernaum here this morning. He wants the people to get repentance, but also wants them to get the city of comfort, the city of healing. That is what the kingdom of God is all about. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment?